Good morning and welcome to our Medicaid Summit 2022. Uh, we're fortunate this morning to have two uh, really good panelists who have experience in the perinatal field. And I'd like to uh, give you a little background about each of these persons. First of all, you're gonna hear from uh, Martha Cook Carter. Uh, some of you in West Virginia may be familiar with Martha's experience as CEO of Family Care, a community health center that uh, she was uh, led for 20 years in the Canal Putnam area. Uh, Martha has a background in nurse midwifery practitioner, as a nurse midwif midwife practitioner for over 19 years. She currently serves as uh, a MACPAC commissioner. That's the Medicaid and CHIP uh, Access Commission. And uh, she also currently works as a HRSA consultant uh, as an independent reviewer. So we'll hear from her first. Our second panelist will be Shauna Lively. Uh, Shauna is currently the director of the Our Moms Project, and we hope she'll share uh, some experience with that project on us, uh, with us while it's ongoing. Uh, Shauna's background is extensive with 40 years experience in perinatal work. Much of that's been involved in high risk obst obstetric experience. She was the director of uh, perinatal and neonatal intensive units at WVU's Ruby Medical Center. Uh, she's also um, developed and led uh, multi-hospital quality improvement projects. And she's a qualified Lamaze uh, educator. So uh, with that, we'll start off with Martha. Uh, doing her presentation and then Shauna. We had a third panelist uh, who was uh, scheduled to be with us, uh, Stacia Quintrill, but she was uh, called away for a family emergency, but she hopes to join us uh, for the Q&A towards the end. All right, uh, Martha, why don't we give it to you? Good morning. I'll get my slides up here. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. There we go. So um, uh, I'm the first presenter in this little panel on obstacles to prenatal care in rural settings. And I've um, gathered information from several sources that I want to share with you uh, for the next oh, 15, 20 minutes. I first want to say that I recognize that all people who uh, become pregnant and give birth identify as women. But those, the term women is what's used in Medicaid statute and regulations. So you're probably gonna hear uh, pregnant women uh, through our conversation today. I'm gonna do a little overview on maternity care in the United States, pulling in some data that looks at um, rural and Medicaid um, beneficiaries. Uh, we're gonna take a look at maternity care in West Virginia and some of the barriers to accessing care and then some potential solutions. And I think Shauna will go into more detail on some of those solutions. I'm gonna share with you some research done by a team at, um, in the University of Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Katie Kazamanal has done a, a lot of work on um, women's health related to access, disparities, payment, and this particular study looks at the intersection of rural, rurality, I can say this, rurality, race, ethnicity, and Medicaid. Um, the team looked at hospital discharge data from 2007 to 2015, a nationally representative uh, sample of all payers to try to tease out what, what are the um, causative factors and the intersection of these, of these factors. Uh, I do want to note that this is only hospital births, and so it's, it doesn't include out-of-hospital births. But since most births in the United States happen in hospitals, I think this is a pretty good um, sample. So just as a little background, we're looking at uh, severe maternal morbidity and mortality 
Um, and some more background is that nearly half of United States births are financed by Medicaid. So while there are definitely national and state efforts to address maternal health, um, they're often not specific uh, to the needs of Medicaid beneficiaries. And, and one challenge is we really don't have good data. I think it, we're, we're working on that. I think it's getting better, but we really don't often know the specific challenges to Medicaid beneficiaries, uh, especially around race and ethnicity. Although we know in general that there are higher risks for black and, and indigenous mothers and rural residents who on the whole more commonly have Medicaid. Uh, just a just level set so that we, we know what we're talking about. Maternal mortality is uh, death while pregnant or within 42 days at the end of pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy, but not from accident. And maternal, severe maternal morbidity is um, basically a, a bad outcome that doesn't lead to death, but it's unexpected that causes a short-term or long-term consequence to a woman's health. Uh, the, one of the main causes is hemorrhage and uh, blood transfusion, need for blood transfusion is a factor that people can look at. So uh, while we um, have, I think the, the, the latest number is a little over 800 cases a year of maternal mortality, there are something like 50,000 cases of maternal morbidity in the, in the United States. So some of the key findings from um, this particular study was that Medicaid beneficiaries have an 82% greater chance of severe maternal mortality and morbidity than those who are privately insured. And some of the other key predictors are women who are of the lowest income level, those who've had a cesarean birth, uh, people with substance use disorder, depression, and of course, chronic diseases, which can uh, greatly affect the, uh, the course and the outcome of pregnancy. Another key finding is that among Medicaid beneficiaries, people of color and rural women are at greatest, greatest risk. I think we, we know this. I, what's I think new for me is uh, really quantifying that Medicaid and rural together are, are a, um, a higher risk. So the implications for Medicaid policy, according to the University of Minnesota uh, Research Center, is that um, in Medicaid beneficiaries are almost twice, like I said, 80, what was it, 80? Uh, yeah, 82%, but almost twice as likely as privately insured patients to have uh, severe maternal morbidity and mortality uh, during their hospitalization for birth. And that um, there are of course racial and geographic disparities in the general population and those are similar. We see those in the Medicaid population as well. And because Medicaid finances almost half the births in this country, uh, Medicaid policy has a potential to address um, these outcomes and the equity concerns. I wanna turn now to West Virginia uh, data and I pulled information uh, generously shared from the West Virginia Perinatal Partnership. Uh, and they got a lot of their information from the West Virginia Health Statistics Center. Before I get into problems, I wanna just highlight that we actually do have some successes. Uh, you know, of course, West Virginia is an expansion state, a Medicaid expansion state, which means that people have more access to regular primary care which is a big factor in helping to address the chronic illnesses, uh, behavioral health issues that uh, can cause problems in pregnancy. So that's really uh, big. And we know from studies that uh, people are more likely to use services um, when, when they can pay for them. We also in West Virginia have a, a, a section 1115 waiver that has allowed us to increase substance use disorder services. It's not perfect, but it has helped us uh, increase uh, access um, and, and uh, types of SED services. Um, in 2019, we, um, through CHIP, uh, women up to 300% of the poverty level were covered for maternity care. And in 2021, um, Medicaid coverage for 
Pregnancy was increased to 185% overall. I think in that same legislative session, uh, postpartum coverage up through 12 months was approved by our legislature, but actually the, the state plan amendment, I believe was just uh, approved last week. So we now in West Virginia have coverage uh, through Medicaid um, for the full 12 months postpartum. Um, taking a look real quickly, like the rest of the nation, about half of our births in West Virginia are paid by Medicaid. Um, an important thing to look at is that our births are actually declining in West Virginia, like our population is declining. Uh, we took a, a big jump down uh, through the pandemic, and I would love to have 2021 numbers. I wasn't able to get that information, but we have a declining birth rate in West Virginia. However, according to the West Virginia Perinatal Partnership, the number of people attending births in West Virginia, the physicians and midwives, is about the same as it's been. It's been pretty much level. So that's an interesting dynamic. What we wind up with here is um, uh, this actually this great map that shows where people can go to have their babies in West Virginia. Um, we, we currently have 21 birthing hospitals and one freestanding birth center. Um, of note, St. Mary's just recently um, announced that they were going to stop uh, maternity services. So you can see there are large swaths of the state where um, access to birthing services is, is quite limited. And this is important um, because other services tend to be clustered around the hospitals. And so access to um, perinatology, you know, other specialty care, um, high level ultrasound, um, those are all tend to be clustered around where the hospitals are. And it really makes a big uh, access problem for uh, all women in West Virginia, but especially Medicaid beneficiaries, which are gonna have, who are gonna have a harder time accessing that care. Mm -hmm. This is a really cool slide that the Perinatal Partnership has um, kept up to date, uh, showing the drive time to a, a place where they can have their baby. And the lighter the color, the longer the drive. So you can see again, large swaths of the state where we really have a, um, a, a big barrier in access to delivery services. I think the last West Virginia statistic I wanna share is this one, uh, looking at the causes of maternal death from 2016 to 2020. And the largest proportion of maternal death are actually due to drug overdoses. So I think this is something that we need to look at seriously. Um, the other, of course, uh, the next um, highest incidence is uh, uh, actually related to problems in childbirth and then other accidents. The fact that the highest rate of um, maternal death is due to drug overdoses uh, lets me go into a, a, a project that I wanna talk a little bit about I was involved in uh, through the West Virginia Alliance for Creative Health Solutions, we did a survey uh, looking at factors that help and hinder entry and retention in Medicaid-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder from the perspective of those in recovery. Just a little overview, we had 225 respondents, which is actually pretty good for um, a population that's often difficult to access. Two thirds said that Medicaid had paid for one or more of their substance use disorder treatment services. 45% had been in MAT for longer than two years. And significantly 42% said they had trouble getting into a treatment program six people said that being pregnant prevented them from getting into MAT. So think back on our causes of maternal mortality and we're still seeing problems with people getting into treatment and pregnant people getting into treatment um, for their substance use disorder here in West Virginia. Why did people decide to go into a treatment program? 
The first two were they were tired. They were tired of being sick. They were tired of having to look for drugs. Um, most of the rest of the reasons, the top reasons were very practical. They, had, they found a program that had appointment times that worked for them. They got into a program they could afford. Uh, they had transportation. Um, so these are very practical considerations that I think we need to, to work on. Um, the other two factors are about their own readiness. They got into a program the day they were ready and they got a prescription the day they were ready. Respondents told us what kept them from going into an MAT program. And the biggest reason was I wasn't ready. So uh, that's a very personal um, in, sort of intrinsic uh, factor that I'm not sure we can do much about. That's at, that, at the level of the person um, who's making that decision. But the other factors, the next three factors are related to judgment and stigma and bias against addiction treatment. Um, uh, and one person actually said that they didn't realize that they could go into treatment while they were pregnant for um, substance use disorder. So um, uh, the, the whole issue, uh, the embarrassment, the stigma around um, treatment is, is a major barrier, uh, a very important barrier. They didn't have a way to pay for treatment. They couldn't get into a program. They didn't have good transportation. The wait time was too long. So some key takeaways from this study are that programs and policies should support people to get into treatment when they're ready. I think our job uh, uh, is to be ready when they're ready make it easy for people to get into treatment, make sure they have a payer source, um, make sure that they know that Medicaid is available. I think there were, you know, from our study, it could, we could see that people didn't know that they could get Medicaid to get into treatment. Um, and that, uh, that Medicaid also pays for transportation, which was, uh, you know, as you saw, another barrier. And uh, a big need is that outreach is needed to make sure that people understand about medication-assisted treatment, um, reduce the stigma, um, reduce the judgment, and help people get into treatment. So just to you know, recap everything, we've got a lot of factors related to increased risk, um, related to Medicaid coverage in itself, uh, Black and Hispanic, people and rural residents. Um, we have a decreasing uh, access to maternity care in the state. Um, we didn't go into previously, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit here is low Medicaid reimbursement. Nationally, Medicaid reimbursement is about half what private insurance pays. I was unable to get good information about West Virginia Medicaid reimbursement, but I know um, when I was at family care, that the reimbursement for the birth center was very low. And it really creates challenges for hospitals and birth centers and practices um, to maintain um, adequate services and adequate access. Uh, West Virginia at this point does not pay for doula services. Um, our reimbursement uh, is not particularly good for lactation consultants. Uh, as far as I know, unless it's changed, um, West Virginia Medicaid does not pay for group prenatal care, which has been proven to improve outcomes. So we have some challenges related to a reimbursement. As I said earlier, lack of transportation or lack of good transportation, about 25% um, of the people in our MAT study had used uh, the uh, transportation through the state Medicaid program. Um, but a lot of people had said that uh, it was it was um, they didn't sh the transportation didn't show up sometimes it didn't get them to their appointments on times and so I think we really need to look at that um, chronic diseases drug abuse and addiction I consider a chronic illness uh, these all factor into uh, increased risk for Medicaid beneficiaries in our state racism um, I I don't have the numbers but we know nationally, I'm sure it's the same in West Virginia, that people of color have poorer outcomes than um, uh, non-Hispanic white people. 
other social drivers of health, housing, violence, food insecurity, all factor into the risk that we have in West Virginia, especially in our rural areas. So what can we do? Um, certainly we can uh, examine uh, our access to prenatal care and make sure that people have good access in their home communities. We can examine um, access to treatment for substance use disorder in pregnancy and make sure there's easy access when people are ready. Um, we need to examine and improve, I think, um, from what I'm seeing, the transportation covered by Medicaid, which is called non-emergency medical transportation or NEMT in the jargon. Um, we need to improve the range of choices, which generally is tied to better reimbursement of birth centers, home birth, midwives, and doulas. Uh, we need to examine the certificate of need process to remove barriers to birth center care and to hospital care. And all through all this and overarching issues, we need to improve data collection uh, with a focus on um, really teasing out the urban and rural disparities and disparities based on race and ethnicity. So that is my background um, presentation. I thank you for your attention. Here's my contact information. And I think Sean is gonna talk about some solutions to some of the uh, problems that I presented. And I believe we have uh, questions and answers after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me today. And I was quite excited to be able to talk about my project. Um, I'm coming to you from Huntington, West Virginia, where I live, but I just got back actually yesterday from Turkey. So it's about 3.30 a.m. there. So if I'm a little off today, please understand that I just got back into town. So um, anyway, I'm happy to be here. So first of all, I would like to say to you that those of you who may not be familiar with the West Virginia Perinatal Partnership, it was um, established under Community Voices and with Sharon Cart, uh, Renee, uh, um, um, Renata Poor, and Nancy Tolliver, among other uh, people that were very futuristic looking at our state and what we could do together. Uh, we kind of spun off from that. And so the West Virginia Perinatal Partnership um, is continues to be a not-for-profit statewide qu quality collaborative. And we were one of the first in the nation. So I'm very proud of that and our state for doing that. But we pulled together both public and private organizations such as ACOG, A1, um, Certified Nurse Midwife Organization, uh, legislators, stakeholders for maternal health in West Virginia. So our mission is to engage and unite healthcare providers, stakeholders in improving maternal and infant um, health outcomes. To that end, we have um, applied for and received, much to my surprise, um, the Rural Maternity and Obstetric um, Management strategies. strategies. Um, I'm sorry, I'm fumbling a bit here. So this is a HRSA grant and they award three entities per year. They did it in 2019 and again in 2021. We received our first year grant in 2021. It is a $4 million four year grant. That sounds like a whole lot of money, um, but when you realize it's $4 million over four years, a $1 million a year. That still sounds like a whole lot of money to me, at least. However, um, there's a lot to be done with that money. So we have to be very judicious in what we do. And we, the Our Moms Project wanted to develop and test these innovative programs for improvement of maternal and infant health. So we were one, Missouri, Minnesota, each got an award and we did too. So 
I will tell you, I was about ready to retire when Amy Tolliver said, oh, look, here's a grant. Let's apply for it. And I'm thinking, okay, sure. It was an arduous process. You know how it goes. They don't give you very much lead time. So we, I just wrote my heart out. I have more than 40 years experience. And I just wrote what I thought would work and what I have seen in the literature. So first of all, our goals here are to improve maternal and neonatal outcomes in the rural region and to develop a sustainable network that we can all work together for the improvement of better pregnancy care, labor, delivery, um, postpartum services, infant development, and develop a safe delivery environment and to also develop sustainable financing models because as everyone knows, you know, if the money's not there, the programs won't go. So we, we've got to make it sustainable, which is always an interesting challenge. And here's the slide that Martha showed, but this spoke to me. Put your hand right in the middle of the state. There's no maternity services available. So we've had many closures, Ohio Valley up in the, Northern Panhandle, and we have had Fairmont closed, and down at the bottom, Bluefield closed. Over at the um, uh, further west, Pleasant Valley closed. Now, um, our hospital here in Huntington, uh, St. Mary's, is slated for closure of their labor and delivery units in November. So all of this has really impacted us, but the one that really hurt the most was Summersville. That's in Nicholas County. So you can see that these women have to travel, and I, I will show you that map again just to make my point, but you can see that there are no services there. So our West Virginia Our Moms Project area covers eight counties. There's Braxton, Calhoun, Gilmer, Lewis, Nicholas, Roan, Upshur, and Webster. And you might ask, why does this look like Pac-Man with a little cut out there? That's Clay County. The feds thought that Clay County was not rural. I can hear you kind of laughing right now. Obviously they had never been to Clay County, but they felt that because it bordered Kanawha County for some reason, it wasn't considered uh, rural maybe. Um, that, that was the rumor that I heard. It now, I think it recently received some designation that it is rural, but when we applied for the grant, it was not. Um, so we had, um, here, here's the drive time map. So here's where we are with those counties right there. And, you know, there's no good way to get in and out of Webster County in February when it's snowing or even Alkins transporting a baby, you know, to WVU. So those are the little um, uh, pink stars that you see. Those are our hospitals, um, our delivering facilities, okay? So here we go. We have two delivering facilities. Um, one is um, Stonewall Jackson Memorial Hospital in Lewis County. And then we have um, St. Joseph in Upshur County. And they each, well, let's see, St. Joseph's probably around 300 deliveries a year, and Stonewall's probably 160 to 200 deliveries a year. We have one non delivering hospital, Webster Memorial Hospital, that is also affiliated or purchased by Davis Health Systems. And Davis Health System has just recently gotten three obstetricians and three certified nurse midwives to help them in their outreach to um, counties such as Webster County that doesn't have anyone. And I think that they're going to Barber County and some of the other surrounding counties. So that's new. And so we're very happy that we're going to be supporting their midwives there. Um, we also have a couple of FQHCs the federally qualified healthcare um, clinics, they will be providing maternity services. The, the two that already are 
include Brown Family Care. They have one nurse practitioner, one, our certified nurse midwife there. She just retired. She was like 80 years old, bless her heart. Uh, she's stuck with it for a very long time, very well regarded. Um, anyway, they are a non our moms entity um, right now. Uh, we had extended the opportunity to them, but they um, declined. But we're hoping to convince them one of these days to join up. And we have New River Health Care in Somersville. And um, they have a family practitioner and um, two nurse practitioners. Minnie Hamilton, it's going to be up and coming. We have um, Corey Groggs, who is a women's health nurse practitioner. She will be doing OB care, and she's beyond the moon excited to be um, doing this. So our first thing is to improve maternal and neonatal outcomes. So as we know, smoke cessation, smoking among Medicaid women particularly, it, it, we have the highest in the nation, the smoke rate. So we feel that if people stop smoking, preterm birth rates would decrease and also other um, comorbidities, you know, hypertension, all of this, you know, throughout the whole lifespan. And we would like to provide more access for substance use disorder, um, drug-free moms and babies, such as um, what Martha alluded to. Increased breastfeeding. You know what? Increasing IQ points with these, these kids. Um, decreasing rates of cancer. Increasing oral uh, development of the, the babies, the children. And decreasing obesity. I mean, we could go on and on, you know, for the whole day to talk about how wonderful breastfeeding is. You know, when I was in nursing school, we thought, meh, formula, breast milk, it's all the same. There's no difference. We found out a lot that, you know, how wrong that thought was. So we need to increase breastfeeding. And I had um, Molly McMillian, one of my colleagues who runs the Breastfeeding Institute, and she said that um, West Virginia is quite low, again, in um, breastfeeding. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, decreasing cesarean birth through labor and delivery courses for nurses. We have an evidence-based labor support through Lamaze. It's a one-day course that teaches nurses how to better support laboring mothers. And we also have a Lamaze um, childbirth educator series that we do once a year for those who would like to be Lamaze certified childbirth educators. And I think that goes a long way in preparing the mothers. You know, they can take online classes. You know, one day classes, four hour classes, there's a variety of things you can do. Also, doula care. We received a um, Unicare grant to provide doula care education, both postpartum doula and birth doula. So we're happy about that. And we do that through DONA, Doulas of North America. And we have a Count the Kick stillbirth uh, prevention program that we can share with these women. All these things are available through the partnership. But many people don't really take advantage of that. So in these rural areas, we will be pushing these programs and encouraging paying for, um, you know, more literature, more training, and to get these mothers uh, supported. We have a strategy for that, too. I'll share in a minute. And then develop a safe delivery environment. So we have um, plans for mobile clinics. Telemedicine is a big deal that, you know, many of the other services use it, but maybe not obstetrics. And we would like to have mother navigators. We found in the last cohort, or they found, that mother navigators or patient navigators are wonderful. They can follow up on appointments, decreasing your no-show rate. They can plug you in, you know, encourage home visitors, WIC, anything that's out there. And we want them to also know about the uh, food banks. The mothers might have some food insecurity, or maybe their electricity got cut off. Maybe they don't know where to go for a baby crib. So this mother navigator can know the resources in that community and um, help them find those things that they need. 
We also uh, would like to educate the emergency departments and labor and delivery staff on things like the AIM bundles, such as hypertension, hemorrhage, which we've done in many of the um, hospitals, but we like to go to the non-delivering hospitals because, you know, sometimes pregnant ladies just end up going to a non-delivering hospital, say Webster, for example, and um, maybe the emergency room um, provider doesn't know what to do with them. So giving them uh, information of not only emergency delivery, but what to do. You know, we've had several incidents where a woman would show up to the emergency room, she's postpartum, and she was told, oh, well, you know, take um, some um, Maalox, you're fine, you're, you know, your blood pressure's up a little bit, but we're not going to, you know, it's no big deal because they're used to dealing with adults whose blood pressure is 100 over 90. That's no big deal. What would you do? Uh, we ask uh, um, emergency room director, what would you do if you um, had this pressure on a person? Well, just probably send them home, you know, it's not urgent. Well, in a postpartum patient, um, it is urgent. And so things like that, that we can catch, that we can really delve into. And now we have um, uh, the other thing that we would like to do is to um, develop uh, these um, facilities and providers develop these plans to in, um, enhance this. We can utilize mid-level providers and physicians to increase, you know, like Martha said, we have decreased deliveries, but the providers are, you know, haven't decreased. They're about the same as they were, um, you know, five years ago when we had about two or 3,000 deliveries more in the state. But they're not in the right places for us. So we need to encourage people to go into the rural areas. Maybe we need to think about reimbursement a little differently. Okay, we need lactation support, home visitation, doulas, postpartum doulas. I had my mother to come when I had a baby, you know, 42 years ago. She was wonderful. People don't have that so much anymore. So someone to help them through that. And so building capacity, sharing resources, that's all what we would like to see. And Dr. Boggs, I was talking to her and she said, you know, she's in Somersville with New River. And she said, they don't want to cross the bridge. They um, don't want to leave their community for care. So we are hoping that we can reopen Somersville um, hospital to labor and delivery once more. That would be my goal for this little project. And um, I think others in the community share that, including the administrator, uh, Mr. Rowe. And I'm thinking it could happen. Uh, WVU has Somersville now, and um, they actually they have about half of the delivering hospitals in West Virginia. and develop sustainability. So we collaborate with PEIA and Medicaid and think of how we can do this. We're hoping that doula care will be paid for by Medicaid. We're working on that right now. And we have a committee form to um, kind of push that through and see what we can do with it. So I'm really hopeful about that. But I think my biggest hope and dream would be that the data will show that support services really work. You know, we've dealt with years hammering out the obstetric, the high risk, and that's important. But I think, you know, we're a village and we have to support these pregnant moms in every possible way and see to it that they have what they need. And I really believe that pregnancy is a window into women's health. So, I had a brief review of uh, West Virginia maternal and infant statistics, but I think Martha went over those. So um, now I'm ready to um, have some questions. And oh, by the way, this year number one was a planning year and it was actually uh, getting um, documents in place so that data can talk to each other. We're uh, the first to use a um, 
health information exchange to obtain this data, and it flows into CAMC's academic research group with Dr. Mary Emmett that is working on this for us. So we're very pleased to have that group to pull everything together for HRSA because they really demand a lot of data, as you all probably know better than I. Thank you all so much for presenting. Um, Martha, if you could also come on camera now, I know we told you one at a time to be on camera for the recording, but now that we're doing the questions, if you would also um, jump on here and then we will get to the questions. I don't believe Stacia is going to be joining us, um, but if she jumps in, she's more than welcome to answer questions as well. Um, and, and definitely Sharon, thank you so much for uh, moderating this session as well. Um, so I've pulled up the questions, and one of the first questions that we have um, is, what is the impact of the continual closing of maternity wards in, on our rural communities? So how does that, how do you all feel like um, that will impact the rural communities? I can start, and um, Shauna, I think, can chime in. We, we actually, I don't know that we have data to show the impact yet, except from the perspective of the Medicaid beneficiaries who say, it, it takes too long for me to get places. I can't, I don't have transportation. I don't have childcare. I can't take off a whole day of work to, um, to go all the way across the state to get the care I need. So uh, I think I'm hoping that, Sh that Shauna's project will give us some more data on the effect of some of these closures and the, um, and the, the efforts to uh, increase access. Shauna, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think you're quite right. I, I think that we don't have good data and I'd love to, for us to have some kind of a data warehouse or something where we have um, I think in California, they have all this data that just flows in together and maybe we're working on that, but hopefully we'll come up with it in another, you know, three years after this project is done. And this is, you know, eight counties and maybe we can have a little um, insight then. Thank you so much. Um, another question that was put in was, how do you all feel the recent abortion ban will change prenatal care in West Virginia? And do you all have any input or thoughts on that? I've thought a fair amount about this uh, from the perspective of Medicaid. Um, we, again, we don't have data and we probably won't for some time but there's a potential for lots of changes. Um, we could see an increased number of births in the state, um, which uh, from the Medicaid program perspective is also increased cost. Um, we could see um, increased uh, maternal morbidity and mortality um, because of these um, maybe uh, higher risk pregnancies that have to be maintained. Um, we may have workforce issues. Um, uh, we don't know for sure, but um, certainly maternity care providers are worried that their decisions will be uh, second guessed and uh, that they will be um, you know, in legal trouble because of a, a medical decision that they make. Um, so uh, we also have potential uh, issues around training, um, uh, training programs. Um, will people even choose to go into obstetrics with this risk hanging over their heads? So, you know, we don't know, and I think it's gonna be really hard to, um, to see the data for quite some time, but I think there's potential for dramatic, very negative effects for women and their families and for the healthcare system in general in West Virginia because of um, restrictions on access to abortion services. Shauna? Well, it, you know, I'm, 
I'm that old. I remember pre Roe v. Wade. I remember, um, you know, stories that you've heard that personal friends that, you know, knitting needle abortion. When um, my college roommate, her sister died of a septic abortion um, and she left two children, young children behind. Um, a colleague that couldn't be pregnant, she was in nursing school, went across, you know, at WVU, and she went across the border uh, to Pennsylvania and had an abortion. It, you know, so these stories, they will start cropping up again, is my prediction, uh, just because it happened before. And, you know, it, it, women um, are desperate. They, they feel like they, the one thing that may not be as, severe and I don't know yet is, you know, now pregnancy among um, unmarried women is more accepted. Back in the 60s and 70s, you know, you could not be pregnant and not be married. Now that stigma has gone away a bit. So, you know, I don't know, um, you know, it will remain to be seen. I know my 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 husband is an obstetrician, and he worries about what about the 18, 19 weaker who has ruptured membranes? How sick is sick? You know, can you induce someone? How sick do they have to be before you actually can intervene medically? And you know, the second guessing that Martha has alluded to, you know, uh, well, was she really sick? Did she really, you know, need to have that abortion? So I, it, it's going to be an interesting few years. Yeah, we don't know. I want to add something because we're talking about inequities and that is that uh, uh, restricting abortion is inherently inequitable because people of means, families of means, will always have access to abortion. It's happened throughout centuries. It happens in every country. Um, if you have money, you can uh, procure an abortion and you're more likely to be able to find a safe abortion. So the inequities are, are uh, extreme based on low income and, and, and women of color. So I think that is the, what just infuriates me the most is that Abortion will continue, and um, what what we're setting up is a situation for unsafe abortion for the most vulnerable families. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, abortion is such a hard decision. You know, it, it's not taken lightly. I would think, um, but you know, it's going to impact our teen pregnancy rate too. I, I figure, you know, that's going to increase. It's already very high. Um, we were seventh in the nation, but I'm not sure. But, uh, okay. So I think we've got just another minute. Any other, any other questions? So thank you both so much for um, addressing that very heavy question, heavy topic. Um, one more directed to Martha. Um, Martha, you mentioned that the highest rate um, of maternal death was drug overdose. Um, what programs do you feel we need or what uh, programming do we need to expand to reduce that? Can you, can you just expand a little bit more on that? Well, sure. I want to give a plug for the um, West Virginia Perinatal Partnerships Drug-Free Moms and Babies Program. Uh, I think that affords great access. But there are parts of the state that don't have that program. And really, we need uh, access to drug treatment programs in every community um, because uh, um, it's not, you know, you're not going to be able to find a drug free mom and babies program everywhere. Um, so um, we need, like I said, we need to have programs available for easy access when the person is ready. And pregnancy is, uh, you know, a good. Uh, um, what's the word? It, it, uh, Motivator, right? For for uh, for women to go into a drug treatment program, 
So um, I think that's the key is just make it really readily available, increase um, harm reduction programs so that there's a great link between a harm reduction program and access to treatment. I could go on, but I think we're short on time. So does that answer the question? Yes, thank you both so much. Sharon, did you have any last minute thoughts that you wanted to share or uh, last minute comments? Hey, well, this has really been so great from both of you. Um, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. I really, want, I would like to hear a lot more about uh, when Shauna talked about the telehealth experience. I think that that could be a, a big tool. I think there's a, definitely a need to relook at financing under Medicaid. And I think an important point there to drive home for people outside the healthcare system is I believe the birth rate of coverage by Medicaid in West Virginia is now up around 60% with the recent extensions and expansion. I could be wrong, but I think I saw that uh, stat. And if so, that just adds to making the case that maternal services are unique in that, that you have, well, 50% of the population or more covered. So it, it's gonna have a more skewing effect, the financing than Medicaid might in other services where it covers a lesser percentage of the service. So that in and of itself is important. Just thanks again to both of you for uh, helping us uh, look at this important topic. And I hope others who didn't participate today will pick up the uh, video recording and take a look at it.